Okay, here we are in scene three. Uh, we know from the end of scene two that Hamlet is on his way to his mother's closet, her room. Uh, we have this short interlude with the king and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Okay, um, the king says here that he doesn't like Hamlet. He's, he doesn't find it safe to, uh, to let his madness range. Um, so that, uh, so that now the king has decided, as he had thought before, um, that he is going to send Hamlet to England, along with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They're going to be, um, they're going to be his uh, companions on this trip. Okay, uh, because the king is just worried, right? There's going to be hazards that continually to grow out of Hamlet's brows, right? So basically, more and more troubles. Um, are going to keep uh, arising if Hamlet sticks around here in Denmark. Okay, so Guildenstern and Rosencrantz agree; they consent to uh, to be Hamlet's escorts, essentially, over to England. And uh, and now they uh, they are sent off with the words from the king: "Arm you, I pray you, to this speedy voyage." For we will fetters put about this fear, which now goes too free-footed. So they're going to put in chains or fetters the fear, which is now ranging too free. Okay. Uh, Polon the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern leave. Polonius arrives and lets uh, Claudius know that Hamlet is on the way to his mother's closet and that Polonius will be hiding there uh, in the, uh, behind the tapestry or in her room somewhere. Okay, and the uh, Polonius tells the king, you, sh you relax, king, go to bed now, and I'll tell you what I know. Polonius says thanks, and, or excuse me, the king says thanks to him, and now we have a relatively unusual occurrence in Shakespeare, which is a soliloquy by an antagonist. Most of our soliloquies from Shakespeare are usually from the protagonist, the primary character, but here we get one from Claudius. This is an absolutely critical one, too. We're going to slow down and work our way through this. So, first of all, just keep in mind that so far the only evidence we have of Claudius's guilt are the words of a ghost, which, you know, trust that as far as you can. Uh, and then the second thing is his response during the play, right? That's all we've got so far, okay? In that context comes this... Soliloquy, he says, my offense is rank, it smells to heaven. First of all, we get the, the acknowledgement from Claudius that he has committed an offense. And there's a lot of this sensory imagery throughout this soliloquy. Here, the, the, sen, the, senses, uh, the sense of smell and the way his crime is rank and reeks. It has the primal eldest curse upon it. Here we have allusion to the Cain and Abel story, Cain's crime of killing his brother. And that is exactly the crime Claudius is guilty of. He says, pray can I not? I can't pray. Uh, my inclination to pray is as sharp as my will, but my guilt defeats my strong intent. My guilt is, so basically you have a guy, and he says it here, I'm in double business bound. I'm in conflicted. I'm conflicted. I, I am torn in two different ways. Um, I, uh, I am both guilty of my crime and resolved to confess it. But as we're going to see, we're going to see which one of those two wins out. He says here, um, if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood, is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Um, this, at least in my mind, is very evocative of both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's uh, difficulty in removing the blood from their hands in the instance of Duncan's murder, right? Macbeth says all the, all the seas of the world would all the green seas would be turned red with the blood of my hands and of course lady macbeth has her out out damned spot uh lines here we have the same kind of guilt which is symbolized by the blood on the hand okay so um the king goes on and then he says down here um what prayer could i say 
I could say, forgive me my foul murder, but that won't work. That cannot be. I'm still possessed of the effects for which I did the murder. That is probably the clearest confession we get from the king. Notice, he didn't tell us how he killed the king, but he is admitting that he did it. Um, and he still is keeping the things that he did the crime for. He did it for his crown, he did it for his ambition, and he did it for the queen. Now, uh, and then the, the king Claudius asks here, he's like, is it possible to ask for forgiveness and still retain all the things you gained from your crime? So uh, he says, no, that can't be. In the world, that can be. In the corrupted currents of this world, it's often the case that you can get your prize and buy out the law. But it's not so above. It's not that way in heaven. There is no shuffling. There the action lies in his true nature. So there, in essence, God knows what has happened. Now, um, what's interesting about this, too, I think, is this is a recognition from Claudius that he exists in a world of moral value, right? I mean, he's not expressing a moral nihilism or an amorality here. He's saying, like, I be there's a world in which, um, there's a world above in which my crime cannot be evaded, in which I'm going to have to admit to it, okay? So um, he goes through this series of questions. Once again, we get this repetition of interrogatives. What then? What rests? Try what repentance can, what can it not, yet what can it when one cannot repent, right? Basically, it's now clear how the, how the, double, bind, the double bind is going to be resolved. His guilt wins out over his intent to confess. And so he, he goes on at the end here to reflect on his wretched state, his black bosom, right? Bosom black as death, his limed soul that struggles to be free. He's asking for help. To the, he asks the help for, uh, from angels. And then he says, bow stubborn kneels and heart with strings of steel be soft as the sinews of the newborn babe. All may be well. Okay, so look at what's happening here. He's basically telling both his body and his heart to show contrition. My knees are stubborn. I don't like to kneel down, uh, but I'm going to bow here. Uh, my heart is made of steel, right? It's made of metal. It's cold. It's hard. But I want it to be as soft as the sinews of a newborn babe, right? See, so he's sort of asking the angels for help in making him seem more contrite, okay? So that was a soliloquy. Uh, he kneels at the end of the soliloquy. We're supposed to imagine that he's kneeling there in prayer. He's trying to repent. Um, and now Hamlet comes in. I'm going to save this for its own screencast because this is uh, a Hamlet soliloquy that King Claudius doesn't overhear. Hamlet is one of those plays, folks, that, that really does have a couple of these odd soliloquies where... Um, someone is providing a soliloquy, and there may in fact be someone else on stage or someone in hiding who doesn't hear the soliloquy. Remember, for it to remain a true soliloquy, it has to be the actor alone on stage with no other character hearing the actor. Okay, So um, this still qualifies as a, a soliloquy because Hamlet doesn't enter till the end, and no one heard this. But we heard it. We know. Claudius has confessed to the primal eldest curse. He has, he has committed a brother's murder, and we know why he did it. We know he did it for power, for his ambition, and for his queen. We don't know how he did it. We don't know how. He didn't say, he didn't, he didn't say it con, uh, confirm the ghost story about pouring poison in the ear, but he did say that he's guilty. Okay, we're going to pause here, and then we'll get to Hamlet's soliloquy.